Jason Liu, welcome to the DTFH. What's up? What's up? You know, like thrift stores are, you know, I was talking to guys, just so you know, I, Jason, I was texting Jason last night. I had a little bit of a podcast drought because uh, as many of you know, my father passed away. I'm grieving right now. I'm a little fucking crazy. And uh, because of that, I, I didn't, like, I, I, I suddenly just ran out of podcasts. And I realized that, like, oh, my God, I need to start recording podcasts. And so I texted Jason was like, can you do a podcast with me this week? It is I. I have returned. Hello, everyone in Duncan Trussell universe. I, I love you all very, very deeply. And, <laughs> and thank you so much for welcoming me back to this incredible space. And uh, I'm happy to be back with Duncan in this uh, shared universe with all of you. Jason, thank you so much, man. Like I, the, the, you, you, Jason asked me, what do we want? What do you want to talk about? And I was like, death. <laughs> Let's talk death. Cause like, and I'll start with this, man. <clears throat> Roshi Joan Halifax said this beautiful thing to me after my mom died that I'll never forget, which is right now a window has opened for you. When someone you love dies, a window opens and it doesn't stay open. It shuts. In other words, the heartbreak that comes from death, or this is how I interpreted it, the heartbreak that comes from death opens up or connects you to the transcendent in a way that nothing else does. And in particular, what I've heard is that there is a certain number of days that a soul goes through these bardo realms in Tibetan Buddhism. That's right. 49 now, days. It's 49 or 39? 49. 49. 49 days. So, uh, so can you just sort of walk me through the Tibetan Absolutely. Book of the Dead? <laughs> Absolutely. So, the Bardo. Okay. The, let's start from brass tacks, right? Enlightenment. Right, so what, what is enlightenment? It depends on who you ask. If you ask the Buddhists, the Tibetan Buddhists, uh, enlightenment is understanding that everything is empty and impermanent. Right. So what do I mean by this? 2,500 years ago, oh, excuse me, 2,500 years ago, or maybe it seems like 2,500, you know, it, it oh. could have been yesterday. It, it's outside the circles of time. It doesn't yeah. matter when it happened. Right. Yeah. But you know, in linear time, 2,500 years ago in Sarnath in India, the Buddha meditated under a tree for seven years to attain enlightenment. Upon his enlightenment, he realized something that nobody, at least in recorded history, had realized before, which is the true nature of the self. Mm. Prior to the Buddha, of course, meditation had been massively practiced all over the Indian subcontinent and of course all of the Indian yogis and the sadhus sure. and all of them right they all have different techniques most of the Vedic techniques relate to focusing on shapes focusing on kundalini parts of the spine uh, focusing on things but moreover largely rely on the metaphysics of the idea that there is a true self that can be attained or Atman right in Sanskrit. Okay. So the Atman in, in Hindu magical thinking is the core unbreakable isness of a, of a being. That's Bhagavad Gita chapter two. It cannot be burnt. It cannot be cut. It cannot be withered by the wind. It has never come into being. Will never come into being. It does not exist. That, that thing, right? That's the one. Okay. So it's, if I were to describe Atman, it would be something like the fact of even existing at all. Just the fact that this is happening, right? It's similar to Kether in the Kabbalah. Okay. Right. Godhead. Right. So, but Indian metaphysics, Vedic Wait, metaphysics. Wait, I'm sorry. I did that thing. I'm very sorry. I did the thing where I go, okay, Kether in the Kabbalah. I don't <laughs> <think>. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> 
But for describe it, Kether is that the very that's the very top part of the yes the tree of life yes and so that's the sort of what's the word the monad the yes absolutely okay so okay got it got it so the, it's the the, all, the number one right the the the, the first Sephiroth so right. okay the so the Atman and the Kether I thought there was a difference because is the isn't the Atman differentiated like isn't there like the individual soul the atman and then the para atman which is the ah uh, yes of- well here we get into the, the the fun thing of vedic metaphysics where it ultimately when you chase vedic metaphysics to their as far as you can go you get the answer it depends on who you ask okay. because india has this very interesting thing going on where depending on who the local guru is, the local guru determines reality and his might be different from the guy down the road. But uh-huh. in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in India and in, you know, uh, Advaita Vedanta or excuse me, Sanatana Dharma, there's kind of this understanding of truths can coexist. I call right. it, I call it multivalent truth. That's my word, my cool. phrase for it. Right. It's like, uh, reality can be different. And that's okay. And that's why in India, for instance, there are more religions in India uh, than the rest of the world put together. Right. Right. So, and, and, and that's why Hinduism has survived for so long because it's not actually a belief system and it just absorbs whatever comes at it. It's like, so the Christian missionaries, it's like, oh, you worship, you know, uh, you know, the, the Jesus Deva, right. Or Muslim, you know, Islam, things like this. Hinduism is very good at absorbing. It's not just absorb. It's not exactly absorbing other faiths. It's um, seeing the truth in them, right? There's the verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Krishna is saying, "Whatever you have faith in, there I will be." It's something along the, those lines. So, uh, uh, the, the I, I I don't remember the exact. I don't have it memorized. It's something on the lines of, you know, if you that thing that you're devoted to what you're devoted to that's god you're the thing if if like i am so merciful then instead of making you find me i will be inside of everything you love and but i'm not gonna be like hey it's me god here in the fucking playstation right i'm just gonna let you connect in this way right now until you you know uh, over the course of millen- millions and millions of incarnations, begin to realize, wait a minute, it's not the PlayStation. Right. It's something, there seems to be something behind the PlayStation. There's right. something behind the muscle car. There's something behind the dollar. Well, this is animism, right? Which, which is close to shamanism. But Hinduism and Sanatana Dharma, Dharma in specifically, is that, right? It's the rec- recognition that everything is God and it's okay everything's okay because everything is god yeah right now the further we get into this conversation the further we stray into delusion oh yeah <laughs> help me help me yeah how so, how so so here's here's where buddhism comes in um so the atman right the idea that there is a core self or a God or a, a true self or a true divinity. And of course, in uh, Hinduism, the idea is that there are many, you know, every conscious being in a sense is, uh, you know, has an Atman and yes. Atman equals Brahman. So, so the God in everything is equal to the God of, of, of everything, right? Yes. It's like everything is God. Yes. Right. So the enlightenment of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree in Sarnath, he sees through this. He sees through the whole game. Yeah. So yeah, if you look at any of the religions in the world, Christianity, Hinduism, uh, Islam, all that, they all posit the monad. They all posit that there is some type of divine oneness, uh, one taste, as they say. Yeah. The Buddha realizes you've all been looking for something that doesn't exist. All these yogis have been sitting all over India trying to focus on tattvas or images or doing pujas, rituals, uh, and, uh, or focusing on Kundalini, things like this. And none of this is real. It's all fabrication. Why is it not real? It's not real because they're looking for essence, right? They're looking for something that is essentially true. 
So here's what the Buddha realizes. There is no such thing as a true self. There's no core of any being. The Atman does not exist. It's Santa Claus. Why is this? Now this, I feel, is like the discovery of quantum physics or something. It's a gigantic leap or the discovery of, of uh, what do they call that? You know, fractional reserve banking or, or you know. Maybe it's like, the theory of relativity. Right. It's a discovery in spirituality, regardless of whatever sect or, you know, religious thinking. It's not about religions. It's a discovery in the field of consciousness that is a massive quantum leap for humanity and that we're still struggling to catch up with centuries, millennia later. Basically, what he says is this. And by the way, the whole of Western philosophy since the 1700s, since Hume and Berkeley and Western philosophy is still struggling to catch up with this, right? What the Buddha realized 2,500 years ago. So he realizes that the, there's no core self. What there is, is interconnections between beings, right? right? There's That's no called essence. interdependency. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think I've said this on your podcast before, uh, but you know, we're having this moment where we're talking, but this moment would not be happening if we were not both here discussing it. And everyone listening out in the multiverses was not here listening to this, right? Without you, the listener and you, Duncan, the host yeah, and the millions of people potentially, you know, who, who could hear this, this moment would not exist. Therefore, it's not a function like I'm talking right now, but this is not a function of some essential core Jason, right? right. I'm playing a role right now. The role is determined by the network, right? Yeah. Does it make sense? Absolutely. Well, it, 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 it yes, it, it does make sense. It's like, uh, the, it kind of reminds me of, uh, the jeweled net of Indra or the, you know, it, we're, we're all being rippled. We're ripples. We're being rippled in that the, the it, in like, I guess the be one cool way I've heard it described, Jack Cornfield talks about this. He says, um, you know, some Buddhist monk was meditating and how, having all these crazy experiences. He's becoming telepathic. He could levitate, whatever, you know, he's setting tigers on fire. I don't know if that's true. I'm adding that on. He's got powers. And so he goes to this master and he says, He's describing like, man, I've been like, dude, I'm setting tigers on fire now. That's how fucking powerful I'm like, I'm having visions. I'm seeing the, the, I'm seeing the entities. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the, the gods. I talked to Indra. Right. And the master said to him, oh, that's great. But you've, uh, you've missed the, you've missed the mark here a little bit because the question isn't like, what's happening? The question is, who is it happening to? And, and that seems to be the, uh, one of the questions that, it, that is, is answered in Buddhism in a way that for an individualist can be infuriating. Deeply unsettling, yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Right? So, so Indra's net, right? So let's talk about Indra's net. So the Hindu concept of Indra's net is that all the consciousnesses in the world are connected in like this giant, imagine like a, you know, a blue lit up blockchain type pattern connecting the all consciousnesses. Um, the Hindu view on this is that it's the nodes that are important, right? So you get a giant, just imagine a giant net, like a glowing blue net in infinity. And the points on the net, the connections between the lines, those are consciousnesses, right? Those are Atmans. Yes. Well, those are, those are, you know, and the Atman is conscious. It is consciousness and it, each individual consciousness is God. Yes. And in its own way is the totality. It's the soul of a butterfly, the soul of a caterpillar, the soul of a, of a, I don't know, like a single celled organism, a bacteria to the soul of like... Uh, the Dalai Lama to the soul of some as of yet uncontacted hyper all the, through the God, the gods themselves. Like yes. it's like every soul is like sort of like photons coming out of the sun. And, and so, yeah. Okay. Right. 
This is the Hindu theory, Indra's net. Yes. So the Buddha looks at Indra's net and it's basically the same topography, but he says, it's not the nodes, it's the connections. Yeah. The nodes are an optical illusion created by the network. You only have the illusion that you're a separate self because it's a point, you're a, a point of, at which a network converges. <laughs> cool, cool, right. cool. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the <laughs> diagnostics of the Buddha, right? It's like, we, we think that we are, we think we exist and therefore we suffer. Right. But we think that there's something essentially true about reality, but there's not. The important distinction here also is this is not nihilism. It's not nothing is real. It's that everything is empty of inherent quality, meaning non-essentialism. There's no essential one true Duncan. There's no essential one true Jason. Right. There's no es essence of anything. There's no monad. There's only infinite connection. Right. Now, this is spiritual maturity, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. So the, the Tibetan Buddha is called, it's the clear light, the, the perception of the primary clear light, understanding the essential non-existence of everything. Now to ground this in, in my life, you know, the way that I've experienced this is on DMT, All right? So December 21st, 2012, I did a tremendous amount of DMT. I, um, while, uh, engaged in sexual antics with multiple people. Wow. Cause what do you do on December 21st, 2012? You gotta go out with, you gotta, you gotta go out in style, you Who know? Who on DMT? I've never <laughs> tried that. I didn't even know that was a thing. It's tricky. It's, it's actually, actually, well, the, it, it, you can't quite do them at the same time. Yeah. But, I know, mean, it a, seems real, but I guess like, yeah, I guess it's man. That's, I don't know how, like, the, the last thing I'm thinking when I'm on DMT is about sex, you know? Because it's so, you're so pulled into this, whoa, what is that like? Well, you don't have consciousness of your body anymore. So basically the sex part stops during the DMT experience. Okay, but, you know, but in between, a, you're right. having sex. It's more about the environment in which the DMT is experienced, right? So it's like you were in it's some, like, DMT orgy or something? That's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. Okay, cool. Why not? You were uh, ready for the apocalypse, man. Well, You're... That, yeah, I'm, I'm me. It's 2012. What Did are you, you going to do? Did you think the world was going to end? I was just, I just wanted to show up and see what happened, you know? Okay. I was like, so uh, it's New York, you know, looking out over the skyline. But in the DMT space, I had the experience of perceiving the fundamental emptiness of everything. And I described it recently in a podcast I did with Bailey J as nothingness, but shining. Hmm. And what I realized was the self obviously doesn't exist, but the self is also a burden and is a source of suffering. Uh, the French called the orgasm, the little death, right? Uh, but what I realized in the DMT trip is that, uh, death is actually the big orgasm, right? The relinquishing of a self, the relinquishing of the idea that you have an individual self is the ultimate orgasm. It's the perception of emptiness and the fundamental clear light of existence, right? right. Oh, if there's nobody there to suffer, there's no suffering, right? Mm. It's an optical illusion. Yeah. Now let's take this out of my wacky life and back to 2,500 years ago. The Buddha had this insight. Uh, this was his enlightenment. And of course this drove everyone in India crazy because it was heretical. But Buddhism is a Hindu heresy, but yeah. And, and in fact, you know what, let me tell you, I, let me just add to that. Uh, I've spoken with, you know, and I, I, when I say hey, it, this is not all Hare Krishnas. It's not all people who are, um, into uh, into Vaishnava Bhakti Yoga, but you know, like all religion, and Vaishnava Bhakti Yoga is the name for ISKCON, which is the Hare Krishna movement, and and ISKCON is one branch of Vaishnava Bhakti Yoga, which has many branches. But I can I remember speaking with a member of ISKCON, maybe listening to a, a talk they were giving, and they were saying Buddhism is spiritual suicide and i believe i can't they have a name for it my mayavadi or something there's a name for the buddhist it's it and it's a 
not it's not good it's not good but it's essentially it's like that by by allowing yourself to be um this is just to underline what you're saying here about there being a stigma in some branches of hinduism not all of them in some branches of hinduism and also in 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 the branches tend to be fundamentalists like the what i love about the ramdas retreats that i go to is that here we have and i'm one of them devotees of neem karoli baba we have bhakti yoga we have bhaktis there and then we have matter the bhakti bhakti love can like that that i want to be a soul so i can love you i want to be an identity so i can connect to you from my specific atman to your atman and yeah, sure, it's a fucking impermanent web that maybe will over a millennia of disassociating, but, but, but right now this is love, man, and I want it. So he takes that and he takes people who are very good at articulating bhakti yoga and way better than what I just did. And he throws them in with like Zen Buddhists, like Roshi Joan Halifax. He puts them on stage together. You know, Robert Thurman, you know, he puts Robert Thurman, Ram Dass is on stage with Robert Thurman at the last retreat, which was about that. And what I loved about it is Robert Thurman gets on stage and he <laughs> said so the first thing out of his mouth as they're introducing him for the first other retreat, he's like, I cannot do a Robert Thurman and Bob Thurman and Fresh. I, <laughs> I wish love I that could. Guy. But he's like, be here now. What does that even mean? He's like, practice, practice, practice. Everyone's talking about practicing, practicing, practicing. He's like, I'd like to see somebody play for once. <laughs> it was so, right at the beginning of the retreat. Just puncture, like cutting through all the like congealed right. nonsense and like trying to find the pure like isness. So anyway, what I'm saying is, yes, in Hinduism, st some forms of Hinduism, Buddhism is stigmatized but certainly not all forms. And bringing the two together and watching the way they interact is one of the most- Oh, it's hilarious. Hilarious, sweet things, especially when on both sides, there's love. Right. So continue. Yeah, and, and these, are, these are games that have been played for thousands of years. Yes. Right? And, and, and remember, I mean, I, I started my spiritual training, not started, but uh, you know, I, I trained as a shaman in Nepal and the Nepalese merged them both. Right. Hinduism uh, and Buddhism are seen as, as, as create this like psychedelic megazord. Oh, uh, what? And me, like a, like a, or what's that called in, in Power Rangers? Oh, okay. Well, damn it. God, I mean, I'm glad it's Power Rangers, but I was praying that you had just added to my lexicon <laughs> of, of some fucking new spiritual term called megazord. Power Rangers. Yeah. It's not, not Sanskrit. Um, so 2,500 years ago. Uh, people start practicing Buddhist techniques and people start waking up out of the dream of their individual suffering all of, over northeastern India. Oh, I thought that I was a suffering woman whose ch child had died and that I would be in that utter grief for all exist, you know, the rest of my life and that there would be nothing but grief and suffering. Yeah. You sit down and meditate for 10 days. Uh, you know, Vipassana is a good way to do it. Sure. And, and Buddhist meditation is you're not trying to get anywhere. You're just sitting with yourself. That's it. That's it. You're not imagining gods. You're not focusing on trying to become something that you're not. You're not trying to, you know, become more pure. You're not trying to become more spiritual. You're just sitting with the feeling, the feeling that you try to get away from all damn day long, right? Whether sure. it's through Xbox or what, you know, drugs, whatever, you know, work, drama, you know, drama, interpersonal drama, that's a big one. Uh, whatever it is that you do to get away from the feeling. So Buddhist meditation is sitting with the feeling until you notice that the feeling is changing of its own accord and the fundamental nature of everything is change and is impermanent and is emptiness. And the whole dream of your life that you thought was real was just a dream until you wake up and say, oh yeah, I thought I was a woman whose child has died and everything was suffering, but it was just a dream. And now I'm awake and people all over Northeastern India started doing this until the whole damn mass of Northeastern India was awake, right? 
that's the first turning of the Dharma. Wow. <laughs> Things got crazier from there, historically speaking, because then we got the, the, the Muslim incursions into uh, India and there was, uh, you know, the Mughal invasions and things like that. And the, the history is insane. It kind of makes me think of like, it's like uh, uh, this like very, very long virtual reality experience that had been going on so long people forgot they were doing virtual reality. And then all of a sudden a huge swath of the player characters began to realize like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not sure that actually, wait, hold on. Wait, I'm not actually Kratos, the God of War. Hold on a second. Wait a minute, wait, hold, who's playing this? Like, wait, wait, who's pushing the buttons on this thing? Wait, what am I really? And then there's that popping out. I like to think of it as um, some kind of, uh, that we're some kind of, um, It's like uh, it's like we're these amnesic spiritual amphibians that like you know pop in here, and when we pop in, we assume an identity, and uh, when we pop out, we um, this is what I used to think actually. Now, th I, so you know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and um, he was using the term over there. And I used to use that term too, the spirit world over there. It's like, there's a place, there's like a, some perimeter, you cross the veil, you cr pass through the veil, there's the spirit world, or there's the whatever the thing. And these days I've been thinking more in terms of, and I said this to another friend, he said, don't call it a meat snorkel, but I've been thinking in terms of meat. So it's like, it sounds like a dick, but I've been thinking in terms of a meat snorkel, which is that our, we're this appendage that is uh, protruding into matter and in the way that a snorkel like sticks into the air so that you can like exist for a little bit of time under the sea, you know? And uh, similarly, we've like protruded into this realm and we like um, have this experience, but we start thinking we're the fucking snorkel, right? That's in fact part of the experience. The snor you think you're the snorkel. You forget there's this thing underneath. I guess a better way to put it would be you have the, 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 the mushroom that grows from the mycelial network, you know, or, or, or there's a million different ways of expressing this very temporary thing that seems to have with it a bunch of qualities. And one of the qualities are identification with the self, identification with the body, identification with the mind, identification with the thoughts, and an amnesic state or an inability to access the matrix of emptiness, whatever you want to call it, the network, the grid, the singularity, the whatever source, as some say, the monad, not an inability, but some difficulty because of our fixation on the self. Well, let's take the meat snorkel, right? I mean, let's, let's go let's with that one. Let's take the meat snorkel. <laughs> My meat snorkel. <laughs> I look the worst snorkel. That's a good, that's good, good of a metaphor as any, right? Would that work? Like, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not going to go on a fucking weird, stupid tributary. But like, if you took like a big chunk of sausage and baked it, and then like drilled a hole through it and formed a snorkel, you you theoretically could swim around <laughs> sucking air through salted meat. <laughs> fucking horrible i love coming to duncan's house it's great here <laughs> how pissed would you be if you're swimming and you look over and there's just a fucking salami sticking out of the water and some assholes like just the whole fucking the air just stinks of pepperoni and coral reef i like the phrase pork snorkel that sounds it's got a certain ring to it pork snor <laughs> porkle <laughs> the worst invention ever made. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want a porkle. I want to. So go ahead, man. Sorry. <laughs> a porkle. We're porkles. So we're we're misidentifying, right? We have a case of mistaken identity. We're here in this whatever this experience is. We think it's real, and we think that we are somehow inherently real, and it's a case of mistaken identity. So this okay. is the Buddhist perspective, at least. So from this perspective, let's consider spiritual practice, whether that's Hindu spiritual practice, magic, hermeticism, Sufism, Islam, any of these things, right? Uh, any spiritual practice 
that's like trying to get to something. I'm going to become more spiritual. I am going to become more loving. I am going to become more this. I'm going to become different. I'm at A and I want to be at B and I'm going to make some change and I'm growing or gaining. I'm getting points somehow. I'm changing. Buddhist perspective is, dude, you're grinding in World of Warcraft. (laughs) That's such a great analogy. Step the fuck away from the computer. Wake up. It's just a game. You're fucking grinding in World of Warcraft. You're trying, all these spiritual practices are, you're trying to add experience points to a character that doesn't fucking exist. You forgot that you're playing a game. Dude, you're dehydrated. Drink some water. You've been playing this freaking game for like 20 hours straight to the point that you forgot it was a game. You're fucking harvesting fucking components to sell art to my crystals. I don't know if that's what they're called. I just remember at some point in my World of Warcraft addiction. It's so funny, dude. I can remember being so addicted to World of Warcraft and fucking... Did you play World of Warcraft, Jason? Or you just a little it? bit. I did have a massive StarCraft addi- addiction, okay. though, which I think we have in common. Let me just look this up. In World of Warcraft, there is an actual economy, right? Yeah, fucking Arcanite, for sure. And like, uh, and you can like, like basically use a skill called alchemy to form various... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember this. Right? Yeah. So like, and I don't know what it's like now because I haven't played in a while. I'm afraid to even even look it up i just wanted to make sure arcanite was a thing but uh, i don't even look at it in the way like a crackhead doesn't even want to look at sugar i don't even want to like come close to it but the it you can like you 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 end up like harvesting sort of uh what's it called components you know for uh, some weird alchemical metallurgy i guess i don't remember it's been a long time but you could essentially produce arcanite bars i think and the arcanite at one point was set it was a it was an economy man and the arcanite would go up it would go down and you could sell that fucking arcanite uh for um for gold and you could use that gold to buy cool shit and like you're like you're out there you're you're if you're me you're it's like 4 a.m and you've been just like your your warlock undead warlock (laughs) dathrak (laughs) has been creeping through this swamp or that place or this place just to try to gather the necessary components to fuse together to make the fucking Arcanite bars. You sell the fucking Arcanite bars or you trade them for this thing or that thing. I I can't remember, but yeah, like at some point it's like you, you merge with Dathrak, you merge with the Warlock. You're not even Duncan anymore. You're not a fucking Duncan. You're a fucking Dath. You're literally undead. You're in the swamp. And doesn't that make the game so much better, right? Oh, yeah. Like, that's kind of the idea of the game, oh, right? To merge, or even, let's say, even watching a movie, you, you, it's suspension of disbelief. Why are we building these crazy virtual reality rigs? We want our virtual realities to be as real as possible. Now they're going to have Magic Leap, all this stuff. It's like, we want to be, that's like the great quest of media to have a, an experience so powerful and overwhelming and artistically satisfying that you forget that it's not real. We want to repeat what's already happened. It's not enough that we we're in our bodies and we've identified with this player character. We want to continue pushing into the simulation. It's like, whereas Buddhism is pulling out, it's like, We've got virtual reality goggles on and we're in a game and now we want to put on another set of virtual reality goggles. And then not only do we want to put that on, but then we want to add to that another augmented reality thing and then another. So this is like um, uh, this this kind of like infinite is ingress the right an infinite pushing into matter and yes. time and infinite. And, and in that kind of pushing into matter and time, we're desperately trying to avoid taking off the virtual reality goggles we're why are we desperately trying to avoid it because we don't want to feel that feeling what feeling the feeling i am as i am right the feeling of everything that you do the addiction the addiction to maya is to not feel your inherent suffering yeah right because it sucks to have a body it hurts the fact that we live in an 
the fact that everything is impermanent is a cause of suffering, old age, sickness, and disease and death. Yeah. Right. Everything we live in a universe in which time exists and therefore everything will disintegrate and be gone. And the suffering of that is unbearable. Yeah. It's not is it? bearable. It's bearable. I mean, if it was unbearable, we wouldn't be bearing it. We're bearing it right now. We're just pretending we're not, right? Isn't that the idea? Like the idea is it's like, so here we, this is, this is like, all right, here's what we got. Suffering, right? And so you're fucking suffering, man. I'm suffering. This is dukkha. Wobbly dukkha. wheel. Wobbly wheel is, is how I've heard it. The, 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 basically, like, the way I've heard it described is this. The way I've heard it described. I'm not going to be mysterious about it. My meditation teacher, David Nickturn, told me. Wobbly wheel. So it's like um, you're riding your bike and one of the wheels is a little deflated, right? And, and so it's not going to be a great ride. You're going to ride your bike. It's not going to be a great ride. I was actually, I just, praise God, got a new bike today because some demonic fuck stole my bike. Such bad karma. Such bad karma. Um, bike theft. Ugh. And they were inflating the tires, and I was thinking of Duca because because uh, my teacher like uses this great comparison, and the you know he's like you know we, you keep it between I can't remember I always forget the psi as soon as I fucking walk out he's like 70, 80, 50, so keep it between this area it's gonna be a rough ride. So the psi of this universe that we're in, or the experience itself, it's at the wrong psi so to speak. It's a wobbly wheel, which means that there is a fundamental wobble in everything, every single thing. It's just always a little up. And the suffering, this is how I've come to understand it, which means it's probably wrong, but right now this is where I'm at. The suffering is coming from, would be like me on a bike with a fucking deflated wheel, pedaling around and having this shitty ride and thinking to myself like, well, maybe if I like, maybe if I fucking turn the, switch this gear, this gear, that gear, this thing, or this will make it better, this will make it better. This I'm expecting the fucking thing to not be wobbly anymore. The analogy's rotten because like I could just fill the fucking wheel up with air, right? I, but in this situation, it's like, well, you have to surrender to the fact that it's not gonna, it's really not gonna work out. And which is why I love when my teacher started teaching me, the first thing he said is, I, re I want you to know this. And Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche, my teacher, said to me, and he meant this. He meant this. And I remember he looked me right in the eye. He meant this. This is hopeless. This is hopeless. <sighs> yes. See, I'm at the part of my life now where, where that's a relief. I've gotten past the part where like i'm in a disney movie where hope is like you know chipmunk singing about like hope will bleed you live and then the... no hope tortures your fucking ass hopelessness now the hopelessness sounds really rotten when you when if you haven't really explored just how much you've been using hope as a flog a a flaw, you've just been fucking whipping your back with hope. Shpack! Ooh, I hope I get that a poof! Ooh, I hope tomorrow smack! Oh, I hope she goes back! Slack! I hope I get forget! Smack! Just beating yourself up with hope. In that one fucking second, you let yourself be hopeless. Let go of hope. Let go. Ah. <sighs> What a great place to be. Let go. The game is not winnable, right? So here's, hmm. Gurdjieff called this the terror of the situation, by the way. Really? The terror of the situation. The terror of the situation. Hopelessness, you mean? The first podcast I did with you, I, I told the story about the, my, a vision I had of the inherent suffering of all existence. Right. Oh, yes, 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 the yes, universe yes. As, a, as a hell realm. Yes. That's probably an over, overly dramatic way of putting it. But here's the deal. It's just a game, right? Everything changes. 
everything is impermanent. Everything is shifting. And this whole story you've constructed about this person that you think you are, the, vo the voice in your head that tells you it's a real thing, it's a person, that voice that sits in your head, the one that, that, that speaks to you and convinces you that it's you, that speaks to you with your voice, that speaks to you with your name, yeah. that you think is you, is not you. It's just a delusion. Yeah. I, yeah, that's good. It's just, it's, it's, um, the fundamental nature of reality is emptiness. It is empty of inherent meaning. And then of course that means that any meaning, whatever can be constructed from it, it's, it's infinite chaos in a way in the best and most creative sense. Yeah. But the Buddhist perception is when you think the game is real, you suffer, right? If you've, if you've, identified with your world of warcraft character and then your world of warcraft character gets nerfed you suffer because you think it's real yeah right right now now this point is important this is something ramdas talks about and i and, and and it's important so you and i sit down and play a game of fucking monopoly you know i do not want you jason Liv, every time we roll the dice to be like you know this is just a game duncan it's not real I want you to be like, I'm gonna take your money, right. bitch. And I, and I, and I, cause that's how you play Monopoly, right? Monopoly is not meant to be played in some kind of like, is, Monopoly is a, is a vengeful game, which is obviously one of the most hilarious <laughs> critiques of capitalism in existence. That right? nobody got. It was actually created by socialists. Right. Yeah. It's hilarious. So it's, it's really, and, 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 and it like just naturally turns everyone playing into like either cheaters deal they, they, they every everybody turns into like we're look everyone's like looking at like donald trump like oh my god i can't fucking believe this is like what are you talking about it's like it really is it's like someone yeah. pulling a fish out of the ocean and being like oh my goodness gracious i can't believe how wet this fish is <laughs> Right. It's funny how nobody got the, the, the point of that game. The point is, to, it's like, yeah, yeah. The point is to demonstrate that the game is rigged. And this is kind of the Buddhist critique, right? It's like addiction, right? Addiction is a great metaphor. Oh, wait, I'm Buddhism, sorry. Let me, sorry. Buddhism. I'm going to, I'm sorry. Very quickly. I'll finish the point. My point is this. One level rigged game. That's okay, too. That's okay. Rigged game. Okay. Suffering. Okay. World of Warcraft? Okay. Dathrak addiction? Okay. That's the thing. Because if we're applying, if we're, if, if we're saying not okay to this thing that we're in right now, then we've applied meaning too. You know what I mean? So it's a perfect not okay i guess you well could say. everything is perfect right this is my this is the this is my perception the universe you know matter matter energy space time as they say you know everything is perfect the universe is constantly fulfilling it is like the god is constantly fulfilling our every desire like yeah. everything is there everything is manifested everything you know all kinds of experiences I, my God, you know, just since you were born, how many insanely colorful, psychedelic, incredible experiences have you had just being alive? Fucking awesome. It's the ultimate drug. It's the ultimate addiction. Yeah. Existence, right? Maya, it. samsara, addiction. Yes. Addiction. Oh, I just want to see what happens next. I just want to see what happens next. I yes. just want to see what happens next. And on and on and on into infinity. Yeah. Right? But it's all inherently meaningless it's just a fucking trip it's just a light show sure but it's fun right. this is the, the this is this is the this is like what i mean and then god forgive me all around us people listening I, you know this is my own interpretation but this is what i love about these retreats is that this conversation we're having right now it happens and on one side you've got yes i love it it's great or what ramdas does is he goes he goes, yum, 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 yum. Which is actually a mantra, by the way. And um, yum, yummy, it's good. It's, mm. You know, and I'm speaking. Well, it's one of the chakras. I can't remember which one. It's a yeah. chakra. Yeah, and it's there's a, chakra a sound. Mantra. Yeah. But I, um, you know, 
having now lost both my parents and grieving, it's still like, you know, this place that we're in right now, it's really quite delicious. It's like, mm, it is a game. That's right. It is a game for sure. And by getting all serious about the fucking game and being like, you know, if I'm playing Monopoly with you, with you, Jason, and I want you to take it seriously. And I would really love to like watch your, like the, 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 in fact, someday we should film ourselves playing Monopoly because I would like to watch your, the, the, the character that, that you play as your. Oh, I have play. a ruthless strategy to complete. I, I can ruin any Monopoly game. Really. Right. Cause I, ha I, I hacked the Monopoly, right? I figured out how to, and I'm not going to give away the That's secret, so but fucking awesome. there's a way I'm to already, completely destroy the game. I'm already mad at you. But, I'm already pissed. but think about it this way. Like why, do, why do people find real spiritual practitioners annoying? Right? Like, or for instance, I mean, let's not get over dramatic, but the whole thing of, okay, like Christ was crucified. Right. It's like <laughs> spiritual practice. Practitioners are fucking dicks. They're dicks. Why are they dicks? Because they're basically running around. Like, imagine like eight people are playing Monopoly, and then Jimmy shows up and is like, "This is a game. Stop playing this game." And Crucify just like, Jimmy. <laughs> starts like hitting the pieces. These aren't real. What are you doing? <laughs> hey, why'd you guys crucify Jimmy? Okay, well we were playing fucking Monopoly, and this son of a bitch is coming around right. like trying to give all the pieces away and play. I don't know. It's a different game. It's like, dude, we know it's a game. Like, just yeah. fight, don't. You're, you're, you're it's, I, I actually I, another World of Warcraft metaphor. Griefing. You know the phrase griefing. Yeah, of course. So sure. griefing. It's like spiritual practitioners. You know, it's like we grief people. We fuck with people's games till they wake up. Dude, this is crazy wisdom. There is a verse in the Bhagavad Gita which says, "Do not disturb them." There, it's in there. It says, don't fuck with them. They're asleep. Yep. Don't be a dick. It's like, so, so, you know, you see somebody sleeping. What, for example, my wonderful, beautiful, pregnant wife. She can sleep late. She's pregnant. She, I think she could sleep till like 10 sometimes. If, like, I can't do that anymore. I got a 44 year old's brain. I got a 44 year old's pickled Burr, my, my, my brain just got burrs and cat. It's like, I'm gonna wake up early. I'm gonna wake up at like six or seven and that's fine with me. I'm okay with it. I accept it. I like the morning, P.S. But me waking up at that time, man, to then like fucking like wake my wife up. Hey, wake up, Aaron. Time to get up, I'm up. Don't you wanna see the beautiful body? Don't you realize how beautiful body is? God, the sanctimonious, the sanctimoniousness of a fucking morning person. Talk about crucifying. Fuck crucify. Crucify a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> the fresh dew on the flowers and the piranhas of the fish. Fuck you! I want to sleep like the night. <laughs> it's okay, right? right? Or, or like somebody running into a movie theater screaming, you know, that every, you're just watching a movie. Yeah, like, yeah, same yeah, type of exactly. Thing. Like we, so, so there's a, 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 a certain level of etiquette, which is that if you find yourself waking up, and this is, of course, one of the neophyte uh, phases, a neophyte who just barely starts waking up will start immediately, I've done it certainly and 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 that's one of the and you and 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 then but then as it progresses what ends up happening is you find your satsang which is like people who are waking up and want to wake oh up. yes people playing the game i'm waking up but not actually waking up okay that's a good one well, that the, is, we're, the, the, the we're pretending to wake up game that's enough that's very chogim trump of you and that and that's a that's a i think that's a phase of it but for sure man because of the quality of existence here we need a community around us of, you know and and like and even if you are you, you at least need to be around people who can say to you, hey, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we playing the game of waking up or are we waking the fuck up? What's happening here? What's going on here? What is it? Are we doing that thing where we're like pretending to be up or not? That's good. Because my experience with it, where I'm at right now, is that you kind of wake up and go back to sleep, yeah. you know? There's a, there's a, there does seem to be a, a process happening, you know? And the process is, um, 
Oh my God, I'm going to quote the Grateful Dead. <laughs> Sometimes the light's all shining on me. Other times I can barely see. You know, that's it. Lately it occurs to me. What a log. I have a bad voice. Straight trip, it's bit. But the point is, like, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're not. And what I, what I love is that when I fall asleep, I've, I'm lucky enough to have teachers who, like, let me. You know, like, all right, go back to bed. You want to go back to bed? Go back to bed. And in fact, one of the coolest, my first contact with the Hare Krishnas was with this um, wonderful devotee named Bada Haridas. And he had a student, a friend. My brother and I were meeting him and he was going to read the Bhagavad Gita to us. And the, it's, it, this devotee had not woken up. He was asleep. And I remember like, my brother's like, where? I can't remember who it was. I don't remember which devotee's name he was. He's like, where is, where is this devotee? And Bada Haridas is like, oh, he's sleeping. If people are sleeping, we should let them sleep. And I thought, ah, oh, that's so fucking cool. That's yes. so fucking cool. Let them sleep. Even if they were awake before, let them go back to sleep. Now we get Mahayana Buddhism. Oh, you mean like Pure Land Buddhism? Or what do you no, mean? No, no. So this works, what you've just described is a perfectly functional framework. You let people wake up if they want to wake up. It's okay. Uh, it's really great to hang out with other people who are awake. It's okay to go back to sleep. In fact, in fact, everything's pretty much okay. Now, Mahayana Buddhism, Bodhisattva vow, I will continue to reincarnate until all sentient beings are liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. Yeah. Right? Everyone has to wake up and I will continue to... Gr keep reincarnating to grief these motherfuckers until they're all awake ha, grief that is now this is not the right word i don't think it's grief i don't think, <laughs> I, think that, that, I think this is a misinterpretation skillful means a paya sorry. okay skillful yes. means okay. Like, skillful means <laughs> yeah because 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 yeah it's like a it's um but yeah that is the body that is it and i love i i think that concept's so be beautiful you know i i i'm still you know a friend of mine once gave me what I consider to be a very great compliment. And he said to me, you love it here. And I do. I like, I like this place. I like it. I like this zone. You know, it's cool, man. I like this little, like, whatever this is. It's pretty cool. I know it's impermanent. I'm not attached to it. I'm not afraid to die anymore. I used to be terrified. But uh, it's, it's wonderful here right now, you know? And, and, um, um, uh, I love loving people. I'm more bhakti than, uh, but I'm also, I love Buddhism too, but I'm more, I'm, I'm Jnana in case you haven't guessed yet. You know, I, I hadn't guessed. I was wondering <laughs> mental. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah, I mean, look, human life is the most precious thing in the universe really. Right. Because in the sense that it's the best game to play of all the games in the universe uh, that you could play uh, being a conscious at least semi-conscious at least semi-conscious person during in a human incarnation during a time of pretty amazing economic well-being and ability to have incredible human experiences yes. whatever one thinks of whatever p political turmoil happen appears to be happening yeah. which is really kind of minor in the grand scheme of things if Absolutely. you look at history it's like a fucking fart in the wind if you look even 400 years ago so um yeah people who are it's it, sorry not to cut you off people who are angry about people who are upset about trump or or, or upset about people who are upset about trump seem to have forgotten their bodies are aging you know what I mean? It's like, dude, why don't we fuck? You need to be worrying about the fact you're going to get old. What about that? Have you thought about that yet? You're going to get old. Your body's going to get all wrinkly and withered and you're going to shit your pants pretty soon. Like, and well, you're upset about the president? The, peop the people who are freaking out about, uh, and yes, Trump is, is, is awful, but the... Then why are you wearing a MAGA hat right now? Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a fashy haircut. Uh, no, no, no. Definitely Go ahead. Not. Sorry, I cut you off. Um, um, what was my... Oh, so the people, the, the whole Trump thing, right? Um, it it kind of reminds me of people who are tripping and think that it's going to last forever. 
you're like, oh my God, it's going to be like this forever. I'm having such a horrible trip. Yeah. It's like, everything changes. Everything's impermanent. Everything like will slowly change, right? Unless a fascist dictatorship happens. It could like, it's like the, like the fe- their fear is that though, like, so it's, it's on both sides. The terror is this one side, deep state takes out Trump, installs spokesperson for military industrial complex slash satanism slash some kind of like um like underground like i don't know like fucking you know it's all the q anon shit like some like <laughs> dark like hollywood like perversion and uh and that they're, they're gonna kick trump out so that they can install someone who is more connected to Moloch. that's one side coup the other side you Russia. gotta do this you gotta do this in alex jones voice uh, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna. Okay, I'll try. Ah, it's a, they're, 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 they worship a fucking owl, fucking goddamn goblin owl, goblin likes to, uh, it's uh, raping kids and get, setting. We, fucking yeah, we got, we got to get the interdimensional child molesters in there. Inter- they're, 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 <laughs> they're, they're riding around on owls, shooting fucking lubricant on babies and blasting fucking, and then they're gonna cut. That's a, that's that's like well, one one side, and then on the other side is, um, uh, you know, the the incredible to me, like the thing that really did give me one of those dizzying, like, all right, not only have I apparently walked into a simulation, but I didn't have enough money for like the well written simulation, or I've got bad taste for this because this particular video game appears to be written by somebody who is the opposite of subtle because. Today, going to jail, I don't know if you read about this, in prison today was the person from the NSA who leaked that the Russians hacked the election. And you know what her name is? Reality. Oh, reality winner? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So our the United States government just put reality in jail? It's like, okay, come on. Are you really like, like, come on. That can't just, you, that can't, the odds, I, I know the odds of someone like whistleblowing and saying, hey, dude, our election got fucked with, you know, th- those are those are pretty good odds that's going to happen if, like, sh- someone's fucking with the election. But the fucking odds the person's name is reality winner <laughs> and that the person who's president was a reality show host, it's just bad writing. Leela, bad writing, yep. It's just a game. You know, all this, all oh, this, by the way, all I'm this sorry. stuff. I'm sorry, whoever wrote it, I, I love it here. I'm telling you, it's. I, I'm, I'm just saying it's funny. It's just funny in like a kind of like a cheesy way, which I respect. It's cool. I don't mean to insult you. Whoever's writing this stuff, you guys yeah, are I mean, you know, if you have it, is it re- America, you know, whoever wrote the American dream right now, the current dream, the current delusion, the current nightmare is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty trailer park. Yeah, it's like it's it's like good. Uh, I love that show, Trailer Park Boys. It's very like Trailer Park Boys, you know, like Antifa versus fascists and right. uh, Trump and all the trashy stuff going on in the in the in the White House. Storm of Daniels, Storm of <laughs> Daniels, and the payoff and the it's like the you know it, it's like the it really is really cheesy. It's like cheesy. It's very like uh, what's the word? It reminds me of like. Um, there's, you know, not, not XXX, but an X rated kind of, it's kind of X rated cheesy, like simulated sex level cheesy. There's something, some, something more creepy about simulated sex than actual sex, you know, like I don't right, know, right, right. low grade porn seems like somehow, you know, creepier than actual fucking somehow. <laughs> I don't know. I'm off on a real tangent. So it's a game. We're in a Leela. This is some kind well, of, well, yeah. I mean, it's like, we look at all this, when you look at all this stuff from the if you meditate long enough to develop the, the mentality of an advanced meditator, I mean, you just look at this stuff and it just looks like Keystone cops. You know, it's like those old movies of, you know, uh, uh, people chasing each other through a hall going, opening doors and closing doors and, and chasing each other around doors. And it's hilarious. It is. And the compassion, right? What is compassion? It's like, it, it's, a, it's such a misunderstood term in a way. It's like compassion is understanding that everyone is already enlightened and choosing to play this game. And the compassion is, it's like, I have compassion for all life and all sentient beings because it's all an extension of, we're all the same thing. We're all this, this consciousness, 
right? Uh, parts of our consciousness are incarnating into really weird games, right? Like incarnating into, I don't know, whatever, whatever happened in, uh, you know, uh, 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 you, you know, the crazy breakdown of democracy in America, the insanity that goes on in various places of the world. It's like human beings play some really weird games. Yeah. Right. But ultimately it's all, we are still all this consciousness, which is itself empty of any inherent quality, just experiencing a light show. So the whole thing about spirituality is that uh, it's really not that special, right? Because all that it does is it allows you to step away from the computer, right? right. It's like, oh yeah, that's World of Warcraft, right? Yeah. Like, oh, right. Oh, right. Uh, oh, it allows you to wake from the dream. And in awaking from the dream, it allows you to remember that your suffering was also a dream, but that also all of your joy and your love and all everything was a dream. Where, yeah. But here's where I'm confused. So, and this is, <clears throat> brings us to probably the last question. <clears throat> One second. That's the dog scratching itself. <laughs> Perfect. It's the drum. It's the drum. Um, here's my question, my final question. And it brings us back to what we were talking about in the beginning, the Bardo states. So you're talking about this waking up, not being in the video game, not being in the game anymore. But every time you talk about this, you're still a thing. You know, you're, you're acting as though as you, you, you wake up and then, and then now you're, you're a, you know what I mean? You're a, you're still a thing. You're like, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. But you're still an I, you're still an I. Um, and your description of Buddhism, which is, which I think was really, really good. Uh, this sort of uh, the interdependency, the no self. Um, it seems to kind of negate the idea of the soul, and and or not doesn't seem it does, you know, or at least like makes the soul another temporary phenomena. So. What is it then that is experiencing these Bardo states? Uh -huh. what, 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 is, what are the 49 days? What, what's going go. through that? So <laughs> here's where it gets really fun. So I opened up by saying, well, let's get down to brass tacks. And then we went off on this huge tangent yeah. about what is, what is reality? What yeah. is enlightenment, right? So the Bardo. So think about it this way, right? You're living your life. Everyone's living their life out there and thinking that it's real. And then they die, right? Yeah. In the bar, when you die, according to the, and now this is in the, the Bardo at all, right? So it's the, I believe the Nyingma Buddhism, right? So the, the, the first school of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, the original school of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, explored this in, in great detail. And you can, you can verify all this by reading it. This is how the bardo works. When you die, you trip for 49 days, right? Because here's what happens. When you're in a body, you're experiencing all these different hallucinations. But as my Sufi teachers told me, as long as you have a body, you're able to modulate your frequency, right? As long as you have a body, you're able to change the frequency at which you're experiencing reality. If this is why human life is so fucking precious. Yeah. It's why human life is so important. It's why human incarnation is the best of all possible incarnations. Because yes, in theory, you could be born as something greater, an angel, a god, something like that. And yes, you could be born as something lower, a demon, uh, something like that. But... The thing about humanity, a human being has a choice. A human being can choose and other things in the universe cannot, right? So as long as you have a, a body, you have the ability to choose, to, uh, make new choices and make new decisions, which modulate your frequency. When you die, you lose that ability. So think about it like this. Your life's a trip. Let's say your life is uh, horrible awful. You live in a war zone your entire life, yeah. right? You're resonating at that frequency. 
um, you, uh, you, you know, over the course of however long you live in such a, such an existence, you have various opportunities to hopefully to change and transform that energy into something else. People get out of war zones all the time. They, uh, you know, get, people get out of refugee camps, things like that, or whatever it happens to be, right? Human beings are uh, experience choosing machines. We choose experiences to have, and then we identify with that experience, that game, right? Who chooses? Well, ultimately nobody, right? But the, 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 but this is our, the previous point of our conversation where we were, we were talking about, um, you know, games, everything's a game. When you see things, everything is a game that becomes, this is in Ram Dass, Ram Dass's experiments in truth. He talks about, this is the idea of burning off karma. And it's, it's like, it, it seems to clash with the impersonalist perspective in the sense that, but so, so what you're talking about is like, and I have, though I do love the idea and the older I get, the more I think it's probably true. I don't completely understand it, but I kind of do get it. Uh, so like the idea is like, all right, I mean, I'm coming back. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to become the meat snorkel again. This time I'm gonna I'm gonna be a um, this time I'm gonna be I don't know I'm gonna be a Palestinian and I'm gonna be born and I'm gonna live to be three because I in, end up getting shot or bombed and I'm gonna experience the just terror for most of my existence and this in some way or another is going to refine or teach or burn off or help me get closer to source or become something uh something divine or it is per it's a perfect expression of the thing and and, and you just saying it it's like fuck that that fucking bullshit that's just another bullshit religious rationalization to make sense of the incomprehensible inconceivable suffering of the world right and so the great example that I've heard is like, you know, think of a squirrel in a fire in a forest that just like, it was just a squirrel. It didn't even do, it did nothing. It did not, it just, it, it, there was a forest fire. The squirrel got burned. It didn't kill it. And now the squirrel's lying on like scorched black and charred ground, twitching in, in slow death agony. And so the idea is like, well, the squirrel picked it. It decided to be that squirrel. It wanted to be the squirrel. It chose to express. The universe is just expressing itself through that charred, twitching squirrel. And uh, and I guess that's perfect, huh, hippie? Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and, and, and the answer to that question, on one level, and it's really hard to hear, and it's really hard to say, is... Yes, yes, that too. But holy fucking shit, don't say that around the wrong person. Definitely don't say it on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm overcome with great compassion and love for all humanity. I love you all so much. Mm. All of you. We, we are all one being you we are all one consciousness experiencing itself through different locuses all over the multiverse yeah we are one being i love you all you are all my greater self mm. we breathe the same breath mm. no matter who you are anywhere in the world Breath is the same. I love you all. And we keep coming back and coming back and coming back to this experience because we enjoy it, because we love it, because we love each other. We want to see each other again. We mm. keep coming back. It's like David Bowie said on, I think, Heathen, one of his, one of his later albums. Some of us will always stay behind. Uh, it's okay. You could say, I like that. We like keep coming back. Yeah. So the Bardo, right? Yeah. All right. So as long as you have a human, be bo 
as long as you have a body, you have the ability to modulate your frequency. Okay. When you die, you lose the, uh, your, your, let me put it in tripper language, right? When you're tripping, you're a, and you have a body, you're a body having a trip. When you're dead, it's just the trip, <laughs> right? It's just the energy modulation, Cool. right? The body's not there. Yeah. So it's just the psychedelic space. Now, here's what happens in the Bardo and listen to me closely because I... this is very, very important. It's actually the most important thing there is in the entire universe. The whole point of the Bardo experience, which is the intermediary experience between lifetimes, is to remember the fundamental primary clear light, meaning everything is empty. Everything is inherent of fundamental essence. It's empty of existence. Nothing is actually real. Right. It's the fact that we identify with the illusion that addicts it us to it. Yeah. We are addicted to the trip. We yeah. are addicted to the illusion. And so we keep coming back to experience it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the Bardo. So, but let's break that down a bit more. So in the Bardo, the soul, okay. Somebody dies. Yeah. Tibetan theory. The soul leaves the body. What is the soul? Well, according to the Tibetan theory, the soul is really an aggregate of various things that think it's, it's an aggregate of, this is, this gets really technical, but this is a fascinating question, right? Because the idea is that the Tibetan view is, it's all these, it's kind of this packet of forward momentums. Yes. That's how I've heard it described. Yeah. I've heard it like that. Or it's like when you hear any tone or something, it's like all the. You're hearing in a tone all these different frequencies and it's just this, it's like sound or something. Yeah. So if you all all that karma is, right, is action carried forward. Yeah. Right. It's just uh it's inertia. Think yeah. of it as inertia. It's like energy going forward into the future. If you do something and you keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep doing it, it it cuts a groove into yeah. reality. Yeah. So for instance, if you work out every day, every day, every day, keep working out, keep working out, then you cut a groove, you have a, you create a karma of working out that will carry you forward and, and it will be harder to stop working out right. because you will keep working out into the future. Yeah. It's the same with lifetimes, right? If you keep incarnating as a soldier, 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 wow. you're building the, the inertia of carrying the identity of a soldier forward wow. into existence, right? But... All that that is, is a and matter and en it's, it's a matter, energy, space, time. All that that is, is a ripple going forward into the future, right? Yeah, I gotcha. It's like you, you do enough, you do soldier for long enough. It builds its own momentum and it goes forward into the future and you keep incarnating. I'm in the revolutionary war. I'm in the, I'm in the civil war. I'm in you know, world war one. I'm in world war two. I'm in Vietnam. You know, you keep, keep reincarnating space into soldier force. lifetimes, space force, Hopefully. right? Totally. <laughs> yeah. Now you're fighting Zerg on <laughs> planet Trussell. Yeah. So it's just, that's what karma is. It's not like this. It's not, we over Christianize it. We turn it into a thing of sin and guilt and all that. Hell, right I know, I know, I know. It's not that it's just energy pushing forward into the, into the future. It that just, which stays in motion, you know, it, it's, it's the, the laws of thermodynamics. It's like thermodynamics, the thing you're doing right, right now, you're probably going to do it tomorrow. Like whatever the thing is you're doing, you're probably going to do it tomorrow. The way you, the, the, you know what I'm talking about. The thing you're doing the thing. I run into people all the time and there's got a thing, you know, it's the thing that keeps happening or the blah. I was right. always this. Groundhog Day. Yeah. 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 So it's like, yeah, exactly. So it's like, so, so this is some sort of um, like um, amalgamation of a variety of like, uh, who knows what forces pushing forward. And so, and there's some sentience there, right? There's some differentiated sentience or something. Right. And it, and it goes into this bar to this like, trip trippy dream state but it's not quite nothingness is it it's still a something or it wouldn't be able to experience the bardo so the bardo so when you enter the bardo you're just the trip and what you experience in the bardo is just your karma 
relieving itself by experiencing itself as a psychedelic trip outside of the space of the body. Yeah. Right. So what that means practically is this, when someone enters the Bardo, they're experiencing a series of virtual realities in which their karmas are being reflected back to them. Yeah. Meaning the events of their life. Yeah. Right. Like all of their karma is now trying to work out in this inter inter intermediary step between bodies. Yeah. So they're having these kind of virtual reality experiences where they're meeting goddesses and gods and demons and, and angels and all this hallucinatory stuff. And all that is, is a consciousness trying to talk to itself, trying to remember that it's awake. Right. So, uh, Jacob's ladder is a, a great movie that really, yeah. really demonstrates this. So, when you're in the Bardo, the whole point of the Bardo is now you don't have a body and now your karma is kind of this free floating packet that's mirroring back its own experiences to itself to try and wake itself up. Right. It's like a free floating satellite in the ether. Yeah. That's trying to wake itself up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, can I like add like to this a little bit? Like the one, one way I've pictured it is like, you know how like, um, uh, like in uh, old like medieval times or movies, fantasy movies, the king's got this fucking sigil on his ring and he pushes it into wax and there's a mark in the wax. The mark of Baratheon or whatever. <coughs> and they fucking mail the fucking thing and you know it came from the king because it's got the sigil of the king. It's this impression in the wax. In the Bardo realms, uh, I imagine what may be happening is that your karma is the ring. And all the surrounding potentiality is the wax. And you're seeing this impression that you've been making in the human life all around you in the form of like whatever it may be, you know? And that can be really, really fucking horrifying if you were not, if you were like, if you were an asshole. Yes, particularly if you're an asshole. So think about it this way. Let's say somebody enters the death experience in anger and rage. Yeah. Well, the bar their bardo trip is going to be anger and rage. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be seeing their frequency mirrored back to themselves. Right. So the whole point of the bardo, so the bardo lasts 49 days. And it's a series of hallucinatory experiences in which the soul is given opportunities to remember itself. Right. So if you read the bardo at all, it basically says point is remember the fundamental clear light that's what you need to do in the bardo meaning remember that existence is empty and nothing none of this is actually real remember that it's a game wake up even if you're not in between in between lifetimes if you can wake up in between lifetimes you don't have to reincarnate because you remember it's a game at which point you can choose to not have to reincarnate Right. Yeah. That's why the Tibetans practice dream yoga. That's why they meditate in their sleep. That's why they do bardo yoga. Yeah. Right. Because they want to. It's like when you train yourself to have a lucid dream, to wake yourself up in a dream, they're training themselves to wake up after they're dead. So death is actually like a like a like it's like a chance. You might be able to jump into a different subway car except in this time it's not like it's a jump out of a subway car. It's a chance to jump jump out of it's a chance to let go of this never ending ceaseless pattern of yes. reincarnating in yes. the matter. Think of it like this. Life is the ultimate addiction. Incarnating into it, into existence is an addiction. When you're not in a body, you have a brief moment of time in which you can remember that you're addicted to incarnating in human bodies and just stop. Right. That's, that's the, the, wow. the Nyingma Buddhist kick, right? It's like, oh. that's what they're talking about. They're saying, it's like, just stop incarnating. Remember that it's an addiction. Will because you just fucking stop incarnating Ronald? It's getting annoying. <laughs> so, but, but, and yes, in theory, you can, ch you, you could wake up enough in the Bardo to choose maybe a more favorable lifetime, but ultimately it's all suffering anyways, because it's all, no matter what you choose, it's all illusion. It's all delusion. Right. It's so, like, you want to make, take another uh, role on the roulette wheel, the wheel of fortune, go right ahead. But it, every single position is exactly the same. At some point you got to stop mining Arcanite, right? <laughs> 
Now, I want to tell you this dream I had last night, and then let's wrap it up. And I just want to hear what, hear what you think about it. I had the best fucking dream about my dad last night. Now, my dad has lived a really great life, but he, uh, <clears throat> a really great life. And he fucking, he loved life, man. And, but, you know, he was never a guy who had, like, tons of money. He, was, he lived in apartments a lot. When I was growing up, we'd go visit him. Always there was an apartment that he lived in. He, he, he uh, it was, he, he would, but that was part of like, yeah, I, I don't know. It was his karma and his karma, I think was pretty good. And cause he was a really like joyful being and he, it didn't matter that he was in where he was, wherever he was, he liked it. He'd figure out a way. It was cool. So I have this dream last night and I'm at an apartment complex. That's where my dad died in an apartment. I'm at an apartment complex, except this one's on the beach. It would be, it was nice. It's nice. And this is my dad's living in a new apartment. And he's showing me his new apartment. He's like, this is on the beach. And he, and he would like that. That'd be cool to him. Right. And he's saying to me <clears throat> in this dream, he's like, Duncan, these two Asians upstairs, there's these two Asians upstairs. are might like been like showing me around and, uh, I see him. Right. He's like, I like them. He's like, I don't know if they're Asians or they're aliens. And I look at him and it's like Tibetan monks. It's like just Tibetan monks, two Tibetan monks. And um, he's like, uh, he says to me, he goes, they're, they keep telling me they want me to teach you how to dance. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's so beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, it's a cool dream, man. What does it mean? Well, what was, I mean, it's beautiful. What was coming to me while you were saying that is to tell you that uh, I have been, tr like, I was trained by the Nyingma Buddhist to read the Bardo, right? So when you read the Bardo Thodol, the Book of the Dead, yeah, you read it for people who have passed, and you chant it in Tibetan, and the point is you're trying to communicate to the other side you're telling the person on the other side, it's, you're, you, it, it sounds, I, I can't, I'm not going to do it on the podcast, but you know, cause I don't have it in front of me, but it's like, you know, what you're hearing is, nye, 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 yeah. you know, like Tibetan chanting, but what the Tibetan words actually mean of the bardo is you're trying to reach to that person on the other side while they're in the bardo and be like, dude, wake up. It's just a game, right? If you wake up, you don't, you can, you can choose to come back if you want, but you have a choice. It's like becoming lucid in a dream. Right. Okay. Okay. I got right. You. Cool, We're cool, trying cool. to wake you up so that you remember you have a choice and I, you can choose to not come back at all. If you want, you can just choose to ah, relax into the infinite nothingness that is shining wow. if you want. Right. But also you can keep coming back if you like, yeah. if you like, it's completely volitional. But the point is to wake the person up. So, because if somebody's in, because here's what happens. If somebody's in the Bardo and they're having a nightmare, it's just like the dream state. They're having a nightmare. And the nightmare is that they're being tormented by the karma of the actions they, of their life. Right. right. They were, uh, anger, war, aggression, destruction, rage, all of that. Yeah. Hell realm karmas. Um, they're experiencing it and they think it's real. It's not real. It doesn't matter. It's like, um, uh, you know, this is where the Christians get it completely wrong. The whole idea of like, Oh, there's an eternal hell you must go to if you, where you will suffer. Oh, there's an eternal heaven you must go to where you will be eternally. It will all be wonderful. Yeah. No, no, no. That's tr Those are trips. Those are just trips. They're not real. Right. Right. The point is you have to remember that it's fucking world of Warcraft, right? So, but what happens is, okay, so let's look at two different scenarios. Best case scenario in the Bardo is that somebody remembers the primary clear light. They remember that it's just a dream. They remember that this whole thing is just world of Warcraft and they're like, oh yeah, right. And then they get on with their day. Right. They don't have to continue reincarnating into the matrix. Gotcha. Right. Um, second best scenario, by the way, is that if they can't fully do that, the best thing to do is to chant the name of the guru or one's own Yidam, personal guardian deity or holy guardian angel, as we say in the Western magical tradition. Yes. Right. So the, the, uh, worst case scenario, not worst case scenario, but the standard 
issue scenario, right? Is that the person in the bardo is unable to remember that it's a dream or does not want to. What happens? Okay, let's trace this back. Jimmy is angry. He's born angry, 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 angry. He lives an angry life. He's a soldier. He goes, he fights in Vietnam. He kills a bunch of people. Anger, anger, anger. His entire life is, is colored and characterized by anger. Yeah. When he dies, he's angry. He's angry at God. Why did you give me this life? Why did you give me this life of anger and suffering? Why, you know, why did I have to kill people? Why, why, why war? Why, why, why? Anger, 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 rage. When he lose, when Jimmy loses his body, he goes into the bardo and it's just the trip of anger and rage. And all of his anger and rage is now personified to him as demons and wrathful, wrathful deities and all this stuff. Yeah. And all the wrathful deities are trying to do is mirror his own state back to him so that he'll recognize himself and wake up. So if he wakes up, he'll remember that he was just playing World of Warcraft and it's really not that big of a deal. And the universe is infinite and loving and empty and it, what, it, it, you know, it's his choice. However, if he does not, now here's where this gets really squirrely. If he doesn't remember, if he doesn't either remember the primary clear light or remember to chant the name of the guru or the guardian spirit, he then must return to rebirth. Now, you remember what I said about frequency. Jimmy has a certain frequency in, frequency in life. When he's in the bardo, he has a chance to wake up out of that frequency or at least change it, you know, at least try to see through it. But if you don't have a body, you can't really fully change the frequency. You can just try and wake up out of it. So Jimmy's angry in life. He's angry in the bardo. So when he reincarnates, where do you think Jimmy reincarnates? He, Jimmy's angry spirit finds a place to reincarnate. He is attracted to the world and finds parents of the same frequency. Mm. Right? You think about people who are born into war, born into abusive situations, things like this. Now here's, okay, this is almost like too hot for TV, but here's the really, really squirrely part about this. And I swear I'm not making this up. This is actually in the Bardo at all. What the Tibetans say is when you be, if you go through transit, the 49 days of the Bardo and you do not remember the primary clear light and you don't remember it's all a game and that it's all an illusion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you begin the pro it's like, uh, you begin re-entry, the re-entry process, yes. you begin to re-enter into the human loca or the animal loca or whatever other loca you've been attracted to. Yeah. Uh, because of the law of karma, you can't just go anywhere. You have to go somewhere that matches your frequency. But the reason this happens, <laughs> this is so, this is cosmically hilarious. The reason this happens is because the, the addiction to sex, right? Sure. So. Now, here's Freudian beyond Freudian. I swear the Tibetans say this. What they say is the reason that people keep incarnating is they're so addicted to the experience of sex that they witness their future parents having sex and are sexually attracted to it and enter into the contract. Wow. Right? But it has to be parents that are at the same level of vibration as them because they're not really able to perceive anything that's not at their same wow. level of vibration. Wow. So if you imagine like the, the re-entry experience as like a non-incarnated uh, spirit watching this gigantic like porn hub of like everyone on earth fucking yeah. and like seeing the ones that are like it and becoming sexually attracted to that wow. and then incarnating as the child of that couple. Oh wow. That's what the Tibetans say. I mean, that, that, what Tibetans are you going to do with that? They're smart. Dude, I'll tell you once a long time ago I had a one eye stand in the condom bro. <coughs> and I can remember <laughs> laying there and like trying to send out psychic signals to any soul emerging from the bardo and being like about <laughs> I guess it would have been too late by then. But being like, "Don't. This isn't don't come into this right now. This isn't what you want. Um, man, that is so cool. That's, I've heard it described. That I've, that's a way better description than what I thought it was because you've studied it. Uh, I thought it was like you get eaten, you get chased by demons into people having sex. So I, 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 my, 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 my version of it was more in terms of like you're running from demons. You're running from something. You see people fucking. You dive into them as a form of escape. But where you, what, you're, what you're describing is like way kinkier, which is more like you're being chased by demons. But then also you see people fucking and you're like, well, 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 what do we have here? <laughs> well, the, the demons are just projections of the mind because everything's a projection of the mind, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, how Freudian is it? It's like, you know, is like, that why people like, do you think maybe like one of the porn addiction is just trying to make a better 
parent choice. Like when we're watching porn, we're just like, it's some instinctual bardo memory. We're like, God damn it. I'd rather them be my fu- Oh my wow. fucking God. Is the type of fucking porn you watched wow. you wish your parents were? Oh my God. Ooh. Duncan. My, I wish my parents were feet. <sighs> Duncan, where do we go with that one? I'm... I have entered the... The emptiness of I have nothing. I have no more to say. I mean, it's the primary clear light of fuck, dude. <laughs> Listen, man, you are a really, really wonderful friend, and I'm so grateful to have you, Mark. Jason. Thank you so much for this. It was so enlightening. Thank you. How can people find you? Oh my God. Thank you, Duncan. That was the. I think we just read the Bardo, but that's got to be the most demented reading of the Bardo of all human history. Can we just, can we, can we package it like that? I, I, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling the truth, by the way, I have been trained to read the Bardo. Cool. Right. So I think that was like the most, that was, maybe we were just reading the Bardo for your dad, right? What is he, what, that my dad is like, how's that reading the Bardo for my dad? What does it mean? That my dad's going to reincarnate as like porn? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that reading. It's the remembering of the primary clear light. <clears throat> but it seems to have already happened because you said that you dreamt of your dad with Tibetan monks. So it happened before we ever even had this podcast. You think that's part of that's him and the Bardo, like maybe yeah. getting a little bit of extra help. Well, it's because my teachers gave me this prayer to read to him as he was dying. And so I was able to like, and it was a Tibetan prayer and, and like, uh, before he died, he read the Tibetan book of the dead. And also before he died, um, I, he was, I taught him, um, and he died with these, uh, Tulsi beads in his hand that, uh, came from a Baba in India. So there are a lot of good forces to help his momentum. And also beyond all that stuff, he was happy when he died. He, there was a lot of love. Wonderful. So, yeah. So my hope is that that dream means that he's got some friends over there. That's what it sounds like to me. Oh, I hope so. Where can people find you? Uh, <laughs> well, let's see. So jasonlube.com. So I've, I've, at Duncan's insistence, I've, I've started a podcast, uh, or, or I'm well into a podcast at this point. You can find it at jasonlube.com slash podcast. And uh, my my book, John D. and the Empire of Angels, has been juggernauting around the world. It, I, from what I heard, I think Mitch Horowitz told me it went through four printings in its first month. Wow. He heard that from the publisher. That's great. So, uh, and Duncan has a quote on it. So you can find that on Amazon. And everything's at jasonlube.com. So you can find the podcast there. And then, of course, I've got a free course on magic that you can get by texting the word shaman, S-H-A-M-A-N, to the phone number 44222. And all of Wait, the secrets also, of magic will be unveiled to but you. But also, didn't also if you call the White House number and say shaman, you get connected to your magic class, right? Absolutely. Jason, you're the best. Thank you so much. <laughs> Drinking blood from the stump of a prison guard that I just chopped up That used to be freedom to me Watching my cellmate cry As I sprayed hot piss in his gouged out eyes That used to be freedom to me